Yeah. Welcome to Nordic Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, owner of the company Horns of Odin, and I'm joined as always by Dr. Matthias Nordvik. Hello, everybody. This time we are joined by Claire Mully, who is a PhD researcher in Old Norse literature at the University of Oxford. Hello. <laughs> Welcome Hello. to the show. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be here. Yeah, very nice. So yeah, thank you for joining us. I know we, we briefly met at Midgas Blot where you did a talk. Yeah. Um, so it's nice yeah. to see you again. Very nice. Uh, I think the last time we were together, we were all around a massive table and there was quite a lot of chat. And it, it went on for several hours, actually. Um, so this, it, it sort of feels like the same weird setup, only instead of around a table, there's tons of small screens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We had a we had a post Midgas plot hangout at Jonas's, um, so that was Matej. You you'd already left, unfortunately. Yes, <laughs> on my on my Odyssey back to the US. <laughs> you had yeah you you already left and missed the panic of the trains being cancelled. Oh yeah, there was that oh, thing as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. There was there was. Um, yeah, okay, so I apologize if there's echo or the sounds funny today. I'm in a different place. I look like I'm in a really cool tent, one of those old kind of like, hey, it's like the Viking style tents. The, you look the... like you're hiding in the attic. Oh, uh, okay. That's the weirdest okay. tent I've ever seen. I thought it looked like a tent. Apparently not. Yeah, it does look like an attic. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so I, I, I'm at a trade show in Birmingham at the NEC. Uh, I've got Alyssa and Eddie here on a book somewhere to stay. Being the tight ass, didn't want to book hotels because they were fortune. So I booked a little cottage and it's probably the most haunted cottage in, in I mean, when I, when I walked in, I was like, okay, this smells haunted. Because you know that, that kind of foisty, old, you know, you know, there's a ghost in here. You can just smell... Yeah. You could smell the ghost. Mm-hmm. Any Brit <laughs> knows that smell. It's true. They do. Uh, it generally goes with very old garages as well, I find. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily all haunted. Anywhere where something's been left to go a bit mouldy, which again is a lot of Britain, if we're honest. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> we're a damp very country. Damp, very damp. <laughs> you are a damp <laughs> country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a damp country. Not- not in a sexy way either, you know. Like, like, <laughs> no. No. Come to, Britain, come to Britain and get damp. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like damp's akin with moist. It's just one of those words. That uh, doesn't, it, yeah. it just doesn't go well. Damp and moist, ew, yeah. At least a cake can be moist. A cake being damp. Unless you're in Germany and you're making a damp noodle, but that's not really cake so much of pudding. And that's very niche. You don't, generally a damp cake's not what you want. Um, no, it makes you think something very wrong with it. Yeah, it's not done. <laughs> yeah, not done yet. So yeah. No, oh, never want to talk about them. So yeah, yeah. I, I keep, <laughs> I keep feeling like maybe a little, a little gill ghost is just going to pop up over my shoulder or something. I um, hope so. Yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> I mean, great for everyone that's not. <laughs> great for everyone that's not in this weird attic. <laughs> 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 but, but okay, Claire, you wanted um, was to help you pick a oh, beer. Yes. Yeah, my, you're my, in introductory, my introductory segment. I'm in Berlin at the minute. I'm on this is something called the Oxburgh Partnership, which is a chance for researchers from either university to swap seas and have a little, just have a time to research in the other institution. So while I'm very luckily here for a couple of weeks, I've been to the supermarket and on a bit of a quest. So I have three beers. This is. Odin trunk. So I'll try and show you the label. It's got the comedy winged headdress, oh, and it's a honey right. So it's mm-hmm. very classic. Uh, number two is the Czechoslovakian goat, which you mm. can see here. Oh, looks good. He's and very the cool. third one, something that is called a spade, and is most definitely not a spade. <laughs> Look at that. It's a it's a, sh- it's a shovel spade. So, Lasty button, clinker spartan. So don't drink water, drink spade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you have to drink okay. the Odin one, obviously. I, I yes. think I have to drink, I have to yes. drink this boy. Yeah, I do. Mm-hmm. All right. 
Let's, let's, any, let's, is anyone else drinking or is it just me? I, I have drink water it. because it's in coffee. the middle of the day here. <laughs> it's just you. I did want to. Usually I would, but I didn't have time to get anything. I, I haven't eaten. I'm forcing Eddie and Alyssa to wait to eat until we oh. finish this. So everyone's miserable at me right now. So they're probably oh. hoping for the, they're so, probably doing so a little incantation why, down there to try to get the ghost here. Why do they have to wait for you to why eat? Do they- I swear, oh, this, when I say this is a haunted cottage, it's in the middle of nowhere. I yeah. mean, there's nothing around. Oh, <laughs> she's, even, she's, she's on the chat as well. I should, have, I should have looked into this a little bit better. Um, we had the, the, <laughs> I have a massive van, a looter van with a tail lift on the back, and I, I couldn't get it into the archway to where the cottage is because the archway was too... Old, old English and it, the van's too big so I've had to just leave it on this little little country lane in the other side of the road tucked there um, so yeah everyone's waiting to order to take out food ah I right. see so yeah unfortunately but we'll be uh, we've got a while we've got a little bit yeah we need to um, so yeah Claire Bob when he when he booked you as a guest gave me the topic of discussion four times and every time i've read it and read it and read it and i still don't really understand it so hopefully you're gonna clear it up fair enough i can clear i can clarify this um also my instagram name just in case anyone wants to follow um this Tonight's little episode is, funnily enough, about the supernatural, which is very appropriate considering oh. where you are. So, okay. kind of, maybe. Talking, uh, we're going to be talking a bit about Erbigya Saga, which is set on Sleifetlisnes Peninsula in Iceland and involves some very famous witch and supernatural episodes. Which, I mean, Matthias, you're nodding, so this, this is a favorite of yours as well. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Ooh. I don't know if it just got cold in here or if I just got a little shiver. I'm getting it. Ooh, it's no. atmospheric. Just, just wait. It's, you have no idea what's going to turn up. Um, in fact, Is maybe, it in an attic? It is sort of, actually. <laughs> There's a similar episode, only this is... Uh, I'm not going to spoil her, actually. I think it's okay. good to give her. Yeah, no spoiler. So, scary story. T- I mean, we might even do a scary story episode. Um, if I turn the lights off at some point, um, and I'll read a bit out, but um, it's so I've got I've got a very good translation here, um, which um, I think is it's one of the best I've read, so I think it's well worth a go. Um, but so just to I guess it'd be good if I gave some background on Erebus mm-hmm. Saga for sure. So one of the settlement sagas, um, the East Landing Saga, and it, it sort of crosses into. So there's obviously people talk about the types of saga, but it's difficult to say, I think, where those titles came in. So you have Fornal the Saga, which are like the mythical, old and very old sagas, which deal with the more fantasy stuff. You've got the Islandiga Saga, which is about how Iceland colonized, basically. And you've got later on, you've got Riddhra Saga, which are more romance style sagas and clearly came from the continent um, and have been adapted. So this is one of the settlement sagas, and it's about how one small bit of land was populated and several generations of people who've been on it come and gone and lived out their dramas. It's kind of like a soap opera, I think, is the best Mm -hmm. way to describe it. You could, if I would genuinely, if I had a ton of money, I would pay someone to make this into a soap opera because it would leave EastEnders, Coronation Street, all the things absolutely in the dust. It's amazing. (laughs) We do, so, we do love a good soap opera. A yeah, soap opera with pagan sacrifices and ghosts. I mean, what's pagan not Pagan sacrifices, like? ghosts, fights, random shit. It's just, it, it's, it's got everything. And it, there's a lot of inter-family killing, maiming, cheating, all the usual stuff. So it, it, mm. it fits, really does fit. Um, all the so drama. The, uh, <laughs> all the drama. Yeah, so I gave a paper on Erebidia Saga recently at Saga Conference 2022. Um, And I guess what I wanted to speak about was the fact that witchcraft is very in at the moment. And I think it has had a lot put on it 
in terms of people, you know, for obvious reasons, wanting to fulfill a fantasy, wanting to see a strong womanhood narrative, wanting to put the healers versus the church narrative, all that kind of stuff. And while all of this has a certain foothold in some truths, it's often witchcraft narratives are to me more interesting than that because there's no one side. And particularly in this kind of narrative, it's not magic against the status quo. It's actually nothing really to do with magic at all. Um, it's all to do with who holds the power. Um, you, you, you could practice magic in any sense of the word, and it wouldn't really matter so much about the magic. It's more about who you are. If you're a strong social character, then the magic is probably good. If you are on the outskirts, then the magic is probably bad. And it's mm -hmm. not about what you do, it's about your status in that sense. So I think that's something that is important to discuss, particularly with regards to this kind of literature. Mm -hmm. oh. I mean, witchcraft's always something that really interests me. Um, yeah. But how do you get witchcraft without the magic? you get it with the magic it's just it's not so much that the magic isn't a feature it's just that the spells are not the front of the theater it's more to do with who's had dealings with who and who's got a grudge and who has been practicing in a way that threatens somebody else so the spells themselves are kind of they're not passed over exactly but they're not it's not like it's a blow by blow account of exactly mm -hmm. what someone cards or exactly how they harness the power or what in this particular saga anyway it's the events just sort of happen and afterwards most of the drama is about picking up the pieces but there's one episode with the ghosts where the events are described in much more detail but it's more to do because the fact that they are ghosts and they're not people doing things to each other in that sense but it's, it centers mm -hmm. around a couple of strong women which of course is very it's something I should probably also say about Icelandic or Nordic witchcraft narratives as well. Um, so you've got this interesting tendency in Old Norse literature. And obviously we don't know exactly what was true in that. We've only got a certain set of clues to tell us certain things. And obviously there's a lot of subtext and context involved. So we can never actually put our finger on and say for sure, this is what practitioners absolutely did. This is the type of practitioner that existed. Um, but Old Norse literature is generally full of narratives that are, well, because of the unavoidably Christian nature of the writing culture, you've often got a bit of an ulterior motive going on. So a lot of magic narratives are linked to women and indeed, there's probably some truth about older religion associating women with certain powers, but we know there was, because this is where we get the term ergi for men, as I think you have covered in this podcast before. Mm. The idea of ergi, you know, being mm -hmm. something being what you might call slightly strange in a man's body, the transformational mm. power, which is considered kind of sexually flexible. Loki gets away with, or Loki likes it. Odin pretends he hasn't done it, or when he does it, it's kind of swept mm -hmm. under the carpet yeah. um so yeah there is this idea of femininity and magic which does go back and clearly has some roots in a real belief but when you look at the more middle ages witchcraft trials all the people killed in iceland for witchcraft were men mm -hmm. um okay. you know you get a lot except of except one woman except one except woman one who woman. could fly yeah uh, yeah no, I always not really no 50 car well, well, I mean, well that's that's <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is that that is uh, that is the one witchcraft trial case uh, in Iceland mm -hmm. that follows the patterns of the continent, where okay. the it's a female who is uh, accused of doing the typical uh, female type stuff that you get from from like uh, continental Europe and and Scandinavia, mm -hmm. and, and the other ones they yeah they they follow a sort of like distinctly Icelandic pattern in. Mm -hmm. In, in yeah what people are accused of okay. and and all that stuff it's it's quite fascinating actually so was it was it a negative thing to be a, a witch and in in the in the saga which is like is it, so, yeah, was it like, is it negative well not always it depends what you call a witch 
the, the, pro, the problem is the word which ha, itself has negative connotations. But people. Well, certainly, who, like in modern time, I guess it only recently seems to be like I think maybe it's evolved being again. taken back. I think, I, think, I think popular culture has made it evolve mm-hmm. again to mean something yeah. really, really, really good. And in a way, that's, I don't know, it's, I don't think necessarily. As I would say, the, 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 the portrayal of magic is very mixed in that sense because you could, there are instances of people doing things which are telling the future or trying to do a health charm or something that would provide good luck or something that would allow you to see what was going to happen. There's that, mm-hmm. that very famous excerpt in Eirik's Saga Rauda where you have a seeress called Thorbjörg Glittenvolva and she turns up and is clearly very well respected. And she goes from farm to farm as, almost with an entourage. And she tells people's futures, but they mm. treat her very well. You know, she's clearly revered. And obviously part of the narrative is that certain Christians don't really want to oversee the right. Um, and that's, it's sort of, they ensure that they tell that bit of the narrative because ultimately the overarching narrative is Christianity is the real power. Um, and part of their way of doing that is not so much to say all magic bad. It's not four legs good, two legs bad. It's magic is over here. It's of the past. This is Christ now. This is the superior mm-hmm. power. But there's still a sense of respect for tradition and a sense of this is what was done. And yeah. often it's a grandmother figure portrayed doing it or a motherly figure portrayed doing it. So it's, so, it's, not, you know, it's not bad. It's just not yeah. the most important. There, there's also that you know, component of whether or not it goes against the idea of God's established order, right? Yes. So, for instance, divination, that's sort of like, ah, okay, whatever. Uh, because what they're really just figuring out is is what God had already planned, you know? that that mm. That's why, you know, divination is so prevalent in in the stories about taking land in, in the yeah. sagas, right? That's okay. Yeah, yeah. That was like, you know, God meant that to happen anyway. So, yeah. You know, so it's, okay. if it's God or, God or Thor, it, it's ultimately what you thought was Thor is God, but it's the same idea and someone is watching over you, so that's fine. I think generally magic is in any form judged for what it does as much mm-hmm. as it, you know, it's, and obviously there's a deeper narrative going on, which is that there's selective showing. You never see a socially accepted or good or strong character ever do bad magic because guess what the narrative is geared towards showing the people in power and how they came to be in power and essentially establishing their right to be there so the even the magic is playing a role in the narrative so in that biased sense we can't you know i'm go i go for the joseph harris point of view this is not truth but it's not entirely fiction this is like historical fiction and while it contains nuggets of something that existed, it's done for a purpose. It's done to make us feel something. And as an audience, the medieval audience are meant to go, oh, well, this is clearly why this family's in charge. Or, mm-hmm. yes, this is their rise to power. This is why they're here. And often the bad, bad magic along the way is like, a, it's like the trial and tribulation in the fairy tale. It has to be overcome in order for them to be established as the ruling class. Mm-hmm. And often okay. you can... There's a very good book about political narratives and magic and sorcerers and kings. It was written by Nicola Mela, and that's that's the other side of the woman. Called. It shows about kingship being established through a magical narrative. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very good read, actually. I have questions. Go ahead. <laughs> so, firstly, um, do you think that magic would have been accepted as being just real as as real as like trees grass the sky like was it accepted as being a real thing because again like today you get some people who believe that magic is real and then you get probably the majority of people would say but like it's it's trickery it's sleight of the hand it's certainly if you're talking about like show magic but but also on like a deep level with witchcraft like most people would just say it's some sort of trickery rather than believe in the magic itself exists? I think there was a belief in magic. I mean, I'm not strictly a magic historian, but mm-hmm. evidence suggests that I think certainly in Britain, fewer and Europe, fewer witches were perhaps executed than people realize. But at the same time, um, 
I think there was a prevalent sense of threat. There was a sense someone could harm you. And people would often, witchcraft does often in its own way back up social tension. So often you get accusations where somebody feels some grudge towards their neighbor. And often, you know, people think sometimes it's men on one side and women on the other. Actually, women jump to each other in it quite a lot. And sometimes I imagine it's, it's much like any belief today. You'll get some who are genuinely hook, line and singer believers. Um, and I don't say that with a sense of patronizing them. I, I mean, full in. And you get some people who are total skeptics, but you get some people who, if they're given a bad enough fright or they are very upset or at a bad period, then they're likely to be swayed towards it. And I do think environment itself has something to do with that. I mean, depending where you live, depending on the geography, depending on how likely people are to die of a horrible accident or how, how isolated they are. As I, I think one of my favorite films that explores this question is The Witch, Robert Eggers, because mm -hmm. it's all about how being out in nature and being fully isolated from a community can, in a sense, make you more likely to fall apart and start mistrusting the people closest to you because you're in each other's faces the whole time and everything is against you. And actually, as it turns out, that's also a power narrative about what happens when you get separated from the community or you become other. That's when mm -hmm. things get you. Or bad I feel that could happen to me tonight. <laughs> I am just, I am waiting for that little ghost just to pop up over your shoulder with a teacup or something. Oh, no, people, people in the chat will be telling me they've seen something move in the background and all sorts. <laughs> <laughs> that. Okay. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's also a couple of things to, to note in terms of like, well, when, when the witchcraft trials takes, would take place in Europe, right? Um, um, what we see are, you know, prevailing anxieties in local communities coming yeah. to the fore. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but um, one of the most common accusations against witches in the French and Belgian area is uh, uh, my wife made me impotent. So mm. uh, what's going on with you guys? Uh, <laughs> of course. <over> there. <laughs> of course. Um, and then, you know, well, yeah. uh, when, when you get to, to Denmark and um, especially Jutland, it's all about cattle herding and beer, yeah. which it's all is about so your much about. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, Norway. And, and then, and then it, sorry, what? I was going to say Norway when you read the fact there's a lot of butter stuff, butter and milk and churning. And yeah. That's but, really but, but we also see, for instance, in the Norwegian trials, is that it's mostly about getting rid of the poor. In the, in the mm. Norwegian communities, like people who are destitute in different ways. Yeah, so they'll come like, around your house and beg. And then if you haven't got something for them, they'll likely get grumpy or maybe mm -hmm. curse you. It's yep. a very good way of assuaging your sense of guilt that you, don't, you can't give them anything. Because obviously, if you're poor, that milk goes a long way and you don't really want to give it to them. But you're also maybe... Because this is the thing, which is what aren't... Films are great at portraying witches as nice, sweet, gentle, misunderstood people. Generally, they weren't. If you no. read up on witch doctors about crap, they're generally the crabby old woman at the bus stop who calls you a bitch or mm -hmm. something, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is really sad. I don't want that to be true. But then if they come around your house saying, give me some milk or your cow dies or mm -hmm. give me some milk or you might be sorry. And so you don't really want to give them the milk, but you give them the milk. Or you don't, and maybe perchance your child catches a cold or something mm -hmm. happens. Then what are you going to think? And obviously, if the local witch finder raps on your door looking for someone to catch, it's very easy to say, her, because... Oh, yeah, because they're not looking at you. No, it's, it's, it's like, in a way, me. it's reflect attention. Not me, look over there. And actually, for all you know, if you are scared, it might be true. I mean, if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's winter darkness, you get however many hours of daylight, you're a bit spooked it's comforting to point to a threat and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So, it, so people do that. Do you think that, or do we know from, from the literature, or at least get to get an idea, that would most of the, the magic, or particularly like witchcraft, be an event happens and then after the fact, the person this happened to kind of attributes that to witchcraft like you just said with maybe you, your child gets a cold um so you go oh no must be a witch or is it that there is a witch who 
says, I'm going to do this, and then it happens. Because they're obviously two very different things. No, but it's both. That's the thing. There's no one case. Like people, I think the thing to remember is people are so freaking complicated. And I know that sounds like a simplification, but there's cases on both sides, I think, where somebody has something bad happen to them and they justify it by accusing somebody. Mm-hmm. But also um, there is the case where some people would set out to harm. I mean, this point's been made very well um, by several professionals, which is that, you know, we try and make the trial for manslaughter today where somebody also where somebody attempts murder that doesn't get away with it. There are cases, probably I think of attempted witchcraft where somebody does make a charm to hurt somebody and put it under the bed or send it along. And just because it doesn't work, doesn't mean the intent isn't there. And Ooh. you do get Ooh, I like that. You do, you do get people trying to practice magic against each other, even if it doesn't work. Um, and the malicious intent is enough. You know? yeah. So it's you almost get, like you also get haphazard people for it. Yeah. It's almost like somebody thinking, I'm sure this has happened to a bunch of people where they think that they've got a poison and they yeah. put it in somebody's drink, but it's it, it's not. Maybe they've been set up and it's just yeah. water or whatever and then so like you say the attempts there and just because they haven't died doesn't mean that you didn't yeah. wish them harm Ooh, that, yeah that there is... was a case did you do you know about the pendle witch trials i mean this isn't strictly nordic and we'll move back to Kattler in a minute who's the mm-hmm. character i really want to talk about do you know how that kicked off it was a little girl at the side of the street i forgot her name yeah, there's a teenager um, there's a teenager called allison um, Alison Demdike, and she's part of a family whose grandmother is a well-known local healer and wise woman. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two sort of feuding grannies in a sense, but the teenager of granddaughter of one of them is begging at the side of the road. She comes from a fairly undesirable background. And she's used to sort of asking for things and getting slapped off. And generally, you know, you, you, you might curse somebody if, if mm-hmm. you were having a bad day or you were feeling got at or generally hungry. And she had the bad luck to curse somebody verbally uh, who then had a stroke. So he was yes. elderly. And presumably, and presumably there's some truth in the fact, you know, if you're about to have a stroke and you're prone to that anyway, additional emotional stress will set you off. So you could say he was just about to have it. Or you could actually say her cursing him and saying, oh, may, may your teeth fall out or, you know, may you die horribly. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what she said, by the way. You'd have to go check the record on that. But either way, there is some suggestion that her curse set off stress in him, which then triggered the stroke. And he was mm-hmm. paralyzed on his left side. They couldn't move. And later on, she, she, that was really what got her and, and started the ball rolling because she was so guilt stricken. She clearly thought she had done it. Um, and, and she couldn't take it back. And there was bodily evidence of something she had apparently spiritually done. Mm-hmm. It does. They are so that, see, got, I, got, I keep getting new questions that pop up because then that would be like involuntary witchcraft because she wasn't intending ah. to, to give. Because obviously, if you're a witch, yeah. you're like, I want to curse you, but she's just like, Oh, you fucking old man, like, give me some change, whatever. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then he just has a stroke. And, she, and then, but like, say, she's like, oh, I did that, but. You can see any kid thinking that, can't you? Like, oh, say a mum or dad tries to make you behave and says, oh, terrible things will happen if you don't go to bed early or if you t- call your sister that. And then something bad happens to your sister the next day and suddenly you're like, oh, that was me. And the, mm-hmm. you can imagine a five-year-old thinking that, right? Mm-hmm. In, not a parent. I've worked with kids and it's amazing how beautifully clear-minded they are with regard to cause and effect sometimes. Um, and I think you yeah. definitely, if you wanted to be a really, I'm sure many parents over the years have abused this privilege of, you know, being able to make their child believe that if they do this, then something bad will happen. Mm-hmm. So oh, absolutely. We, I think who's to say it was any different with slightly older children or people from a more superstitious age who just wanted to, their family to toe the line. Mm-hmm. And then inadvertently you'd get a case of, someone thought they'd done some dreadful harm when actually it was just coincidence or mm. like the trigger of the stroke, just bodily stress causing something actually real, but rather than a spirit, it's just, it's medical. Mm-hmm. 
for sure. We we were in Trondheim at the the weekend, and the art gallery has this sculpture demon thing on the side of it, and it's quite terrifying. And my initial yeah. thought, my initial thought was, how many parents walk past that, and if the kids playing up, they say, if you don't behave, that thing's gonna come and get you on a night time. Because I guarantee it's a lot. I bet. It, I bet. It will be. It'll be a lot. I think I said on the podcast be, before. There's um. A place called Lion Chambers in Huddersfield Town Centre. It's got a big stone lion on the top of the building. It's a magnificent, magnificent um, sculpture. And my mum, when she was younger, my grandma used to say to her, "If you didn't get home before a certain time, this lion came down and would eat you." And like, that was just so, even as recently as that, you see. Like, mm-hmm. So that was like a, a thing that that was used to to scare people. Yeah, it's uh, much more. By by the way, the, the last. Um, a court case about witchcraft in Denmark was in the 1930s. Oh, God, that's yes. really... I had no idea it was that recent. Wow. Well, actually, that's, uh, that was a, a, a... I think it was a man who, um, who sued his neighbors for slander oh. because they had been spreading rumors about him being a witch. So... Um, yeah. That's why I didn't say witchcraft trial, but court case. Mm-hmm. Court case. I mean, you could. It's the same in medieval Iceland. You can actually be done or sued if you call someone a witch or ergi. It's it because, of course, words were indicative of often a higher truth, much like clothes were indicative of a higher truth. Um, hence that wonderful scene in the Limelungen lead where you have um, Brunhilde and Gudrun fighting over the church door in their best clothes because obviously the one who looks best clearly is the best. Mm-hmm. It's not simply a matter of looking it, it's a matter of it becomes the truth. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you, you could you could re- lay your reputation on the line if you slandered someone, definitely. And so, there is... Do, do we ever see anybody getting off with... Because It feels to me like if somebody accuses you of being a witch, that's just a death sentence. Because I guess that's how he's portrayed in like TV shows no. and that kind of thing. Yeah, it seems no. like no, that, no, 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 that, you, that you're done for. Like you're you're gonna get put on the either burn at the stake or put on that little seesaw thing that dips you in the water. And oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly the sure. Yeah, that's to, that's to decide whether you are a witch, though. That's mm-hmm. that's part of a trial by water. But no, Matthias, it was sh- you're shaking your head too. It's it's right that there were people who were accused and got and actually. One of those is in the story tonight. Um, she is accused mm. and gets off. Um, and again, as you'll, it comes down to social power. But a lot more, there is, you know, again, I teach with a witchcraft expert and she is, her name's Diane Perkis. She's written a lot of amazing books. In fact, some of the people in the chat may know who she is, I imagine, because she's been on documentaries in the past. And, you know, people like her will tell you that quite a few people got off because the evidence against them just didn't seem right. But obviously all the big cases that make it to the sensationalist documentaries are things like Salem, which was ridiculous because the amount depended on spiritual evidence as opposed to scientific evidence. Um, And there's also, you know, structural uh, reasons for why people were acquitted. Like there are ex- yeah. plenty of examples uh, from, again, from Norway, where you have a local court that convicts somebody of witchcraft, and then mm-hmm. it goes to one of the higher courts in the cities, and there they they're not down with the whole panic that's happening out there in oh, the village. They're so just, they're like, nah. and they're just, yeah, yes, they're like, exactly. uh, no, someone's granny just swore. That's yep. what happened. <laughs> Yep. Whereas in the village, someone might really hate Granny, or they might have had a feud over some cows for a couple of years, and so everybody's got a side, mm-hmm. and it's real. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's very interesting. So, last thing before we we get into the the story, um, you mentioned good good magic and bad magic. What do you think the diff? What's what's the difference? What's good magic? What's or is it all You're relative to? To who's on the receiving end? So, I think it's all relative to who's looking at it. I mean, I guess to a church person um, or a church official, it's difficult to know. Iceland is such an unusual country in the literary sense because so many magical stories are, again, to do with priests because they were cons- and good magic ones as well, not just black magic, because they were considered a stage above and they wore black robes and they chanted in Latin, which 
must have seemed like a whole other plane. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately for me, um, it seems that the, the more general consensus seems to be that if it causes people harm, then it's bad magic. I mean, okay. and, we're not, and we're not talking here about the crazy witch hunt that happened in the Middle Ages after the plague. We're talking about earlier. So when, mm -hmm. you know, cottage garden magic was more a thing or the idea of, I mean, there was even a stage in Protestant history where Catholic prayers became synonymous with magic spells because mm -hmm. just because they were on the outside. So it was, yeah, it's whatever, there's two things really. It's whatever the, whatever the body of power don't want you to think or follow or want you to do, generally the magic's on the other side. So mm -hmm. you've got your Catholic prayer, which becomes a spell. Generally, though, if we're talking just a community case, I would say it's probably to do with, you know, um, whether the magic harms somebody. And mm -hmm. ironically, a lot of the witch finding remedies are as much magic themselves because they involve a chant or they involve somebody in Salem got in dreadful trouble for making a witch cake, which is to take some of the afflicted person's urine, mix it in corn and feed it to a dog so the dog can sniff out the witch. Now that's obviously a spell, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and yet somebody who had that down as not bad because it was, in, it was um, functional. It was for mm. finding the bad thing. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, um, Hypocrisy, because how come Jesus gets away with not being called a magician? Because that well, fucker did magic. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Daniel, Daniel, I'm going to stop you right there because um, uh, Christianity has had 2,000 years of discussing that at this point. <laughs> and they've come up with a bunch of the uh, theological loopholes. So he's a, he's yes, a miracles, are. right? So that he's, yes. he's a miracles. Yeah, that's the same for the saints. That's as the key well. word. Mm -hmm. Miracle or magic. Did you do it with the agency of God or did you just do it when you shouldn't have done it? Which, mm -hmm. of course, is a massive hole. Mm -hmm. But it's what's, got, it's what's passed as an explanation for many years. A hole, a hole in Christianity? Never. I don't <laughs> believe it. Can't be. Nah. <laughs> no chance. Can't be. It's, it's holeless. <laughs> Oh, oh, no. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, okay. Oh, Let's get into I want to hear about Catla now. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, Catla, the coolest, coolest witch ever. I mean, well, well, maybe not the coolest, but I love her. Um, I just love this whole story. So, um, we have a little bit like that. We have two women who in their own sense fulfill a narrative purpose. So on the one hand, you have Geirida, who is a matriarch of a family. And her, I mean, her father's a bit problematic, but he's, he's sort of off somewhere else. He does become a ghost at some point, And then his burned ashes make an animal go crazy. And there's all this whole, all the magical narratives are sort of linked by some hook or crack. And it's really very fun. So Geirida is, She's famed in the neighborhood for being a cunning woman. So this is an example of what they would have seen as good or acceptable magic. And the funny thing is, um, I talk about this in my paper. So the ways in which they describe the two women and their powers are very interesting in that they, co they coincide very nicely with what the social point is. So on the one hand, Gerida, she is known as a cunning woman there's people come to her for learning craft, but it's only ever described as her being cunning. She, it's never said exactly what she does. She's just got a higher form of knowledge. And obviously in Old Norse, we've got, we could have a whole discussion about how knowledge is power and memory is wisdom. And it's just the fact of being on a higher plane of knowing that kind of makes you magical. I mean, look at Odin, look at the quest he has for information. Um, so Derrida is one of these wise people. People go to her for whatever purpose. They go and learn from her. One of these is a local youth called Gunnlaugr, and he goes and is sort of her apprentice. Um, and, he, and it's never said what they do. It's just said that he goes for lessons. It's a bit, I guess, a bit like a kid going for violin lessons, only he's a teenager by this point. Oh, I, um, I, bet, he, I bet he's going for lessons. Lessons. That, that, no, mm. this comes in. This comes in. Um, so Kathla is a widow, 
She is, so when Gerida is described, basically her family is described. She had this male relative, this male relative, this male relative. Her looks don't come into it because she's already established as a social power. She has son, she has, um, there's people crying in the chat. <laughs> I, I got distracted by that too. Quickly, I might give, give a little plug. If you do want to listen to watch the chat whilst the uh, episode's going on, you can follow us on Patreon. Throw a little, throw a little plug in there. Throw, Why throw not? a bow to your watcher. Yeah, throw a bow to your what, little Do you want to watch live? Patreon forward slash non employed podcast. <laughs> Maybe hey, a ghost will turn up. Who knows? Maybe, maybe maybe the ghost will maybe the ghost will come in the chat. Cyber ghost. Ooh. Ooh. And it'll start messaging you weird messages from the beyond, saying like, "Oh, you should make a bet on this horse tomorrow." By the way, or something. <laughs> All messages on the internet are messages from the beyond. They're from the beyond. <laughs> if um... there's a challenge for you, can you if do any... a ghost message? If anyone's funny, they're going to change the name in the chat to Ghost and then troll. Oh, they're going to get, I think you'll find they're going to be more inventive than that. Um, oh, I think I'm... you'll find you're going to get a slew now. Hopefully. Oh, oh no, because I'm going to get oh, people. Yeah. There we I'm going to get, get, get people fucking texting me and ringing oh, me. Then, what, like, what's that thing behind in the morning? you? Yeah. What's that behind you? It's got a oh, seat up. Mm, the, oh, oh, I'm also also troll, trolling now from people <laughs> sending me a, all kinds of weird around now. There's, there's, a, there's a certain ghost called Robbie for asking where's the coconuts. Um, I wanted to ask that as well. Um, how long till we can expect the coconuts? Oh, I keep saying it's next week. It's next week, and I keep letting people down because something keeps coming up. But I've had three back three back to back weeks of just insanity. So I will. I, I'm, Next week, no one's gonna believe that. One day, mm-hmm. one day, I was gonna pop. I could honestly. Well, in my defence, this episode was scheduled for Tuesday, um, and then Mateus had to move it because for, for whatever reasons. So I threw me out of threw me out of the loop. Didn't have a chance to do it. I apologise. Um, Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. It's gonna happen. Okay. I'm so, doing it. Somebody, if somebody wants to do pottery with you, Dave. If the ghost is here, if this ghost is here, it will now make coconut shell noises. This, this is what I would like to happen. Just like-, like Monty Python? <laughs> yeah. The, the horse yeah. going? Oh, imagine if... That would be so... Cr- oh, I'm not going to say that. Because like, Robbie mentioned ghost in the pottery scene. I was like, imagine if like I just felt something around me and... But then I was like, no, I don't want that. Don't want that. I don't want to put that in the universe that I'm going to feel a ghost cuddle me from behind. I, I don't want to oh, see that. Maybe <laughs> ghost, what's wrong with being spooned by a ghost? Maybe they never get to be the big spoon and hey. they just, you know. <laughs> they my, really wanted to be the big spoon. My, they my really wanted my... to be the big spoon all their life. And, and now. Oh. Mike, Mike, you caught my only dance account. <laughs> Uh, be <laughs> some fresh some content when I start that. <laughs> you you're doing the this the ghost scene. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah, really just me on my own pretending, but bit of role playing never hurt anyone. Oh god. All right, <laughs> let's get All back right, to um, the, let's get back I'm to the story. Drive driving my car back to the autobahn <laughs> away from. The... <laughs> Go on, Mateus. Um. So. Social signaling. We've had Gerida, who is Miss Perfect. She is local cunning woman. God knows what she does. She just does it. People love it. And they very much respect her for it. But she is described by dint of her male relatives. So connections are king. Um, and that's what she has. So she's established. She's a community figure. And this is why, to some extent, you feel she is accepted. So then we get Katla who is the other side of the coin. She's a widow. She lives a bit out of town. Um, Obviously, widow, no male relatives, except her son, who is problematic in himself. So problematic, in fact, that they don't describe him for a couple of lines, you know, and he comes in later. He's kind of a bit of an Iago figure, and he goes around spreading rumours and causing trouble. What a bitch. Um, So... Yeah, he is. He, he genuinely is the kind, he does the kind of stuff that people say women do, and I'm sure they do. But the fact is, men are also massive bitches and just as capable of this, which is something I often get 
crossed about when people talk about, you know, what ladies do and stuff. So this is, mm -hmm. I need to find the phrasing here for Kapla. So she is described as, um, so she's no male relative. She's described according to her looks. So she is which means she is a fair woman, but not to everyone's way of thinking or not to everyone's liking. Um, some people translate this as not well liked, but I think it's more subtle than that. So it's, it doesn't say exactly how she's off kilter, but there's a suggestion of weirdness. Um, it could indicate that she is beautiful, but not common looking. So she's got some sort of facial feature or coloring. It could suggest that she is racially different. Um, and often, indeed, we do get narratives where Salmi women, Finnish women, are the, you know, what they used to call laps, which obviously you would never use nowadays, but that would be connected with your ability to do magic. Um, mm -hmm. Hebridian women as well, which we'll get into. Or it could mean that she's not to everyone's way of thinking, because, not to everyone's mind, because she's somehow socially wanting. So it, it's left kind of in the dark as to exactly what is wrong with Catler, but there's something just a bit off about her. Mm -hmm. And okay. so the scene is, so now, so we, there we have the two sides and the scene is set very nicely. And obviously there is the imminence of what's going to happen, which is that Catler's going to do a bad thing. And indeed mm -hmm. she does. This was where I, this is essentially where my TED talk, as it were, came in because the next bit people assume is about sex. I disagree. I think it goes deeper than that. Um, so, Katla is clearly into Gunnlaugr, who, if you remember, is the teenage apprentice and goes for lessons. So it's, it's never actually indicated what they did. And, and I'm sure some people would read into it that they were having some sort of affair. And that's kind of left in the dark for you because it's there is meant to be a pull about about powerful women, and you can imagine that she would there would have been an attractiveness to her in some way, where, wh whatever way you look. Um, and that's and so even if it didn't happen, it's sort of left in the dark that that's. I think the important thing is to think that that's what the community might think of it as. Um, it's really that's it's it's all about what people say about you as opposed to what's really going on, and that tells mm -hmm. you about the community rather than the story. So anyway, they're they're going for the magic lessons, and Takla, um, her son Other sometimes goes with Gunnar to the lessons or to hang out, and when they pass the house, he talks to Katla for quite a long time. So this to me is indicative that she is sufficiently attractive to command attention because she doesn't force him to talk to her. They are in conversation for some time. And there's clearly a bit of flirtation going on. Um, and then at some point, you know, she asks, so she asks the very rude question and she's clearly trying to sort of undermine Gerida. So she asks if he is going, are you going up to the farm to stroke the old woman's groin? She says. Um, I think she was about sex. It is and it isn't, bear with. Um, so it's like, he says back to her essentially, oh, who are you to say someone's old? So essentially smacking back and being rather insulting in the process. And she says very tellingly, well, with all you men, you don't think anyone exists apart from Gerida, but there are other women who know stuff as well. That's essentially what the old Norse says. Um, it, it's quite a, that's quite a literal translation of the words. And so, it is about sex, but it's also about her being jealous of the other woman's position in the community. So, mm -hmm. and when you think how closely sex and power are linked, that actually does make sense. People want to be with the top person. And people are jealous, not just of people getting pleasure, but it's not about getting off. It's about what the getting off says about you. Are you judged to be attractive? Are you judged to be desirable? So mm -hmm. Gerida's knowledge and standing is attractive. And Katla is focusing on knowledge. She's not focusing on, is she more attractive than me? She's focusing on, I know as much as that bitch. That's what's okay. going on in her. So, so this is a, like a high school drama. This is high school, just, but it's not, so but it's not adults do this scenario. too. That's the thing. This isn't kids. Adults do this too. And I see it every day. And it's, oh, it's yeah, sad, yeah. but 
it's true they do so this is this is a power struggle and sex is only partly mixed up in it now obviously there's something going on because otherwise there wouldn't be the level of flirting there wouldn't be the the crude references but it's far deeper than i just want to shag this guy it's i want to be seen by this guy as this woman is seen because that means i've made it and i am accepted and i am desirable which mm -hmm. let's face it I think most of us would confess in our darkest moments, we want to be seen as desirable. We want to be accepted. Mm -hmm. We can say, well, fuck all of you till the cows come home. But actually, we don't always mean it, do we? Mm -hmm. it's, I, think, I think we can probably that's, agree. Probably when you say, do, do we, then it was aimed at me. I don't know, I felt quite, felt quite judged then for a second. No, I won't. <laughs> when you said, do we... I felt it was like aimed at me for some reason. It was like, you're like, do we? Like, I don't know, do we? Maybe. <laughs> See, that's my special power is making people feel guilty. Uh, She's always. She's always. It has been said. It has. It has been said. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh yeah. I mean, not, not seriously, but Are you there has been the only. Miss here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's been you... said too. I'm, I'm sure that's been said too. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I used to work, I blame the small children. I used to work with small children and do story time a lot. So I think doing the sort of little rhetorical aside of do we, or but we know what it's about, don't we? It's sort of a, mm. a little tick to do what I tell people. Yeah. It's, it's not that I think you're five, Dan. It's just that I, I, I have started speaking to people. I react like, like a five year old, is what you're saying. <laughs> oh, you react like a five year old. Is it me? <laughs> it's, like kid, it's like the kids and the demon all over again going did i do that but yes that was you <laughs> that's, 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 that that's was exactly you, how i felt that was you. I, was, I was always looking over my shoulder to be like are you speaking to the little girl ghost in the corner or is it me no you'll know it's the little girl ghost where i start going i put that down no no that's not sensible is it no, no, put it yeah. down and, and then you, then you'll know there's something behind you with a large pole or whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> this is happening. Um, <laughs> I hope, all I can think of is that um, we, I hope we're not going back to the old uh, the, the Patrick Swayze pottery scene with somebody behind me with a large call. That was I mean, my uh, concern for a second there. It <laughs> would make I mean, I, I mean maybe it's it. the ghost of Patrick Swayze. Would, <gasps> would be, maybe would be he's here. Oh, yeah. Would, would be good only dance content, though. I mean, I, I if you if you think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the story. Back to the story. The, the bad bit hasn't even happened yet. So, um, Gerida and um, Gunnlaug are having one of their lessons, and he says to him at some point, you know, oh, I don't think you should go out. Tonight. I don't think you should go home by yourself. There's evil spirits abroad. I mean. A cynical modern day interpreter might say she wants to force him to stay the night. Um, I have no comment on that. I think it's just part of the narrative build up myself. Um, so they have words. He's like, no, Debbie, I, I need, I'm going home. Debbie's and, and, and they sort of, they don't have a row exactly, but they have words and he leaves. And then he never gets home. He stops off to drop other at home and Catler's not downstairs. She's already in bed by that stage. But she calls down to ask if he'd like to stay the night. And he says, no, I've got to go home. And she's like, oh, well, suit yourself. Um, but obviously the fact that she's up there is, again, creating narrative tension. Uh, nothing happens in Saga, as most of you will know, without there being some reason or build up or detail that's important. So she's up there, hidden, apparently, to all intents and purposes, ready for bed, going to sleep. In the morning, so good lawyer hasn't turned up all night. His father looks outside and finds him beaten, unconscious, and massively wounded in his shoulder area. It's so horrible that the flesh is falling off the bones. Like he's been so badly lacerated. And mm. people say he's been troll ridden. He's been ridden in the night. And you know what that means? That means a witch has sat on you and has in some way destroyed, you know, they, they've taken you on a night ride. And there are, of course, sexual connotations with that as well. Um, you, some of them. I mean, you the right, spirits riding a ridge pole. It's all part and parcel with a cow going a bit crazy, and someone saying, "Oh, they're troll ridden," or they've gone a bit troll crazy. So it's it's all part of the same umbrella of thought. Mm -hmm. um, so, Odder, Kapler's son, tellingly spreads the rumor that Gerida has ridden him 
as a witch, that she has clearly, because they had words before they left the house. And so obviously he is, for narrative purposes, as the narr- you know, as is obvious to the audience, deflecting blame from his mom. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rumor does go around the neighborhood, in fact, that this is what Gerda has done. And people actually swallow it fairly quickly, but it's dropped because several of her male relatives and friends and they're very powerful come to court and swear on their lives that she didn't do it. You know, they, they come and speak for her. And again, as with the display of fashion, as with the, you know, the public reputation, this clears her name. There's no trial, there's no ordeal for her. It's just taken as good as word that these men know she's innocent and that Mm. so many speak for her, so therefore she is. And nothing more is said about it. It's swept under the carpet. It's just an embarrassing episode. So there's your example of someone getting off, Mm -hmm. as as it were. And um, <laughs> I just, I mean, all I can all I can hear is innuendos, and I don't know why it's happening. That's all I keep hearing. I, I mean, we have to be fair. There is a fair amount of sexual content in this story. Um, okay. Yeah, it's just it's the way it goes. The way it goes. Okay. Embrace embrace the innuendo. Um, but yeah, so nothing's heard about it for some time. And then several dramatic events occur, which I won't go into right now, but obviously the tension is again building towards Catler being found out. So there's a, there's a quarrel between Gerda's family and her son and another neighbouring powerful family. And in the ensuing chaos over some stolen horses, which Odd stirs up, um, mm-hmm. someone's hand is cut off. The wife of Gerda's daughter, the, the Gerda's daughter-in-law has her hand cut off. She's no, her name is Oida. And um, in, it turns out that Odder has done it. He's been wearing a cloak that his mother Catler has made for him, which essentially makes him invisible. So no. again, all of Catler's craft is very much out in the open. Unlike Gerida, who's just coming, she actually performs spells, does stuff, so I th- which is, I mm-hmm. think, what differentiates them. It's clearly craft. It's nothing to do with whether you're liked. Um, and then it, it boils down that eventually they, they sniff out who did it. Um, it the, the knowledge comes out through the women that it was Odder who cut off the hand. And they decide to go and, ironically, it's not so much to do with hunting out his mother, it's to do with hunting out him. So the men go oh, around God. to his house. Of course. He had a fucking invisibility cloak. I'd be like, you're a witch. Yeah. That's pretty... Oh, yeah. That's a uh, witch He's word. That's it, right? That mm-hmm. is witch worthy or wizard worthy. I mean, Odder is kind of himself in a, he's not the one with the craft, but the way he behaves is in a way wizardly by all those landic terms. So he's mm-hmm. changing his shape and getting out of things and slipping in and out of trouble. So oh, I, I, yeah. I'd risk being burned at a stake to have an invisibility clock, though. Would you? I'd, oh, yeah. You know, badly I wanted an invisibility clock when I was younger. Yeah, I, I, I want one. I do want one, it's true. Yeah, but you wouldn't get burned, though. You'd get hanged. They didn't really burn okay. witches. They, oh, they did really? it on the continent. No, on the continent sometimes, and I think in Scotland, they would burn the bodies after the witch was hanged so they wouldn't come back like a vampire. But English witches were hanged, Icelandic witches were hanged. Um, it, also, it's much less... Also, of uh, decapitations, too. Yeah, decapitations, too. You're right, Matthias, yeah. So it's... Um, it's not as common as people think. I think it just sounds more dramatic. It does. Um, it, you know, it looks cool say, too. You see it in the films all the time. So is that, is that again, oh, like yeah. a, a mis- misconception from Hollywood? Mm-hmm. Not always. I mean, some t- in some villages in, say, France and Germany, they'd have mass burnings. But again, mm-hmm. it's not millions. It would be hundreds. <laughs> and that's, and that's like- big enough in a small population. Yeah, I think for somebody like me that knows not much about witchcraft, the, I would have said like 95% of witch deaths would, would burn at the stake. Mm-hmm. That's like from just from going through life and seeing bits and pieces here and there on TV and whatever, like 95%. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, the, 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 the purpose was just to execute them, you know. Mm. Yeah. That does really... Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, and there's a purging, I think there's probably a purging element as well, but that's, yeah, for most, I mean, and Salem as well, it was hangings. And that was dreadful, I mean, it was still dreadfully cruel because generally it wasn't just a nice short, sharp drop. They would be left to swing and suffocate for 20 minutes. Um, 
to the extent that family would sometimes be called to pull on their legs to kill them more quickly and, and get them out of their misery. So it was oh. still horrible. I mean, it, the, mm-hmm. the, the, de, the, the demotation from burning was still horrible, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Actually, the burning, right, like that you're in a, in a situation where, you know, it, oxygen is being sucked out of where you're at. Very yeah, quickly. you might suffer yeah. quite fast. And also, while, while we are at the whole dispelling myths about the witchcraft craze and all those things, I just want to mention that of all the inquisitions out there, the Spanish inquisition was actually rather nice. They, they were not <laughs> as evil and no, psychotic no, no, no. as the, the Spanish other Spanish Inquisition to be nice, but yes, they weren't the <laughs> <laughs> They were relatively Mateus, chill. <laughs> you know that's getting quoted now. Mateus, <laughs> the Spanish Inquisition was rather nice. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I don't want to say that the Spanish Inquisition says that. And you're quite like, yeah, can you put that on the mug? I want that. What? Yeah. Put it on I, the I mug. want that on the mug. I want that on a mug so that oh, I can Oh, absolutely. <laughs> T-shirts. I like, to collect, I like to collect interesting mugs for all my Skype tuitions and things. Yeah. And, it, and it's always fun for your student if you've got, I've got one called, I've got the one about let's eat grandma or let's eat grandma, comma, save lives. Mm. And that's, that's one of my favorite. <laughs> that's a good one. That is a good one. So, this showdown, right. which, is, which is the best part of the story. So, um, the guys come for Otter. They want to have it out with him because he's cut up a woman's hand. He's done a lot of shady stuff. Hapler is, in fact, shall I read the story? Would, would this be a good time to pick up the storybook? And, and sure. Read it to you? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, suitably, it's suitably old and dusty. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if, the, if, if I was them and I was after him, I'd still be trying to find that invisibility clock, though. I know. I'm, I'd want I'm, to use it. And do does, think- doesn't have doesn't Harry Potter have one? So can you just like uh, go like don't don't you guys live like right around the corner from hmm. that, that uh, school yeah. he goes to right? So- and does the invisibility cloak become visible when you take it off so you can find it again, or does it always well, change? It, well, presumably you'd have to find it. And I mean, hmm. I don't think it, in Catler's cloak's case, it's not so much that it makes the wearer invisible, it makes him harder to see. So you could just say it's a camouflage cloak. Oh, so like that, shitty, it, it that makes, shitty car in the James Bond film all the time. Yeah, it makes you harder to see and it also protects you from injury. So I'd say it's more made of a tough, dark material. And it'd be very easy to say that was bewitched, but it was probably just really tough leather that had been treated in a certain way. Oh, so he was just kind of... Live- They've dramatized this, haven't they? The he was camouflaged. Of course, was a weird no, no, of course they they've dramatized it. He was, a, <laughs> he was a weirdo walking around with a leather cloak on cutting off people's hands. And he's they've said that he's invisible. Yeah, in, in modern culture, they just call him the handyman and make a Netflix drama about him. But as it mm-hmm. is, it's... Uh, <laughs> Slager. I mean, Slaga is all about the understated drama. Like, none of them talk like they're in an Italian so far. In fact, half the drama is the fact that they talk much like my family in Yorkshire might talk. I mean, that mm-hmm. everything's sort of understated. Like, you don't say, you don't go, oh, my God, what happened? You'd say, well, you look a mess. What's wrong with you? Or, or you'd say, oh, so, so, so I understand some trouble happened with it. And then, it's like, and, and then the shit comes out, and it, and it turns out to be really dramatic. But it's mm-hmm. always the understatement. Maybe Dan, you can probably corroborate this. This is how people mm-hmm. talk up north. Like, if there's no yeah. there's no flapping about. It's all oh, I see someone's cut your leg off. No, oh, that must that must that was inconvenient. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Which, you're, you're right. We're very um, unanimated people. I might not be be like that. I get quite animated on here sometimes, but for the yeah, most part, so particularly the old the older generation tend to be quite. Oh yeah, unanimated. Quite calm. Yeah, or, or look, they don't like a fuss. I, I think the way I describe it is they don't fuss. Oh yeah, sense. they could they could be bleeding out and they wouldn't want to bother anyone for for like a bandage. Like just they would not want to we would not want to inconvenience. Yes. Doesn't want to be a bother and will mm-hmm. die in her own blood in a pool on the floor. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, sounds like a well trained working class right there. 
Yeah. My, my grandma was a nurse and a very good nurse, and mm. she nearly delivered me. And I'm pretty sure she is a witch, actually, in the in the uh, way that counts. Um, very well preserved, she is. <laughs> so it's uh, let's see. I think so. Shall I? Shall I give you? I won't do all the story, but I'll do the little snippet where it's it's essentially a witch on witch showdown. Um, okay. And Gerida comes to deal with Katla, and I really like the way it happens. So it's um, but the first the men try. And they're useless. So oh. the arm, this so-called uncle and his men get to Katha's house, and Oda is being hidden. So she she sits on the in the hall spinning yarn, and she told Odd to sit beside her and don't move or make a sound. And she told the women to remain sitting where they were and be quiet. She said, "Let me do the talking." So as soon as the men the men come inside and um, they ask where Odda is, they can't see him. So she says he's gone. <laughs> so he's got a fucking cloak on, hasn't he? No, no, it's more powerful than that. She has cast a spell. So what it turns out is she, they, they search the whole farmhouse, you know, and they don't find him. And they saw that Katla was spinning yarn on her distaff. They looked throughout the house, but they did not find Odd. And after that, they rode away. And when they'd come a short distance from the farmstead, Arnfield stopped and said, I wonder if Katla pulled the wool over our eyes. No pun intended. Could it not have been her son Odd, which looked to us like a distaff? It's not at all unlikely she did, replied Thorin. Let's go back. And they did so. So she's disguised him <laughs> in the story of the distaff. Can we just pause with that co- yeah. like conversation for a second? It's like, oh, it's not unlikely at all. It's like, what the fuck? I know. <laughs> so this is, I think this is classic hindsight. It's like, he was probably in the freaking barn. But someone would say, oh, well, clearly she was working at her spinning wheel. So that must have been where he was. That's obvious, right? Yeah, geez, that's totally obvious. Yeah. And this, and so she becomes the cunning woman hiding her son. Mm-hmm. So they thought he became a spinning wheel. Did I understand that right? Yep. Mm-hmm. He just transformed so the, into a... The, yeah, he, just tra- he was transformed into a, a tool for spinning. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, oh, so not the actual wheel, just the, the little stick thing. The, the, you know, the, the stick thing, which where you have the wool and you're... And you're 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 spinning you're spinning the wool into thread, and you'll see women doing it like a yo-yo. That's mm-hmm. what it is, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So he, the spindle. So he became a spindle. He became a spindle uh, in, in the story. In there, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is that's likely. They thought and maybe then, he was a spindle. Yeah. Yeah. So, but Catholic's one step ahead of them. So they saw them coming back, and Catholic said to the women, "You stay in your places again." Odd and I shall go out to meet them. But when Odd and Catler left the room, she took Odd to the vestibule outside the outer door and began to comb him and cut his hair. Okay, so far, so good. Uncle and his men rushed in through the outer door and found Catler there, busying herself with her goat. She was trimming his forelock and beard and combing his matted pelt. So again, she's predicted that they're going to have seen through the ruse and she's made a new one. He's now a goat. Um... <laughs> Catherine's distaff lay on the bench, and then they felt sure that Odd had not been there, and then they left and rode away. But when they approached the spot where they turned back the first time, Arnfell said, <laughs> Don't you think that it might have been Odd in the shape of a goat? There's no way of knowing, <laughs> replied Thorin. But if we turn back now, we ought to lay hands on Catherine. Of course, big surprise, they don't, because she's one step ahead as ever. Um, when they were seen approaching again, Catherine told Odd to come with her, but when they'd come outside, she went to the ash pile and told Otter to lie down by it and stay there no matter what happens. Let's play a guessing game. What do you think he's turned into this time? People Fire. in the chat can join in. Fire. Fire. Because of the ash oh. pit. But the ash pit's mm. where you chuck it out. It's a okay. rubbish pit. Not fire. What could, go, what could be on the rubbish pit? Ash. <laughs> <laughs> he's turned into more ash. You were that kid in school, weren't you? He <laughs> turned <laughs> into a bucket. So what do I get if I put five oranges in a bucket and then five more oranges? A lot of oranges. <laughs> <laughs> a bucket. He turned into a bucket. Turned into a bucket. Um, they have buckets. They must have had uh, some form of milk in there. Um, yeah, they did have no, buckets. It, yeah. A bucket. What do you think? A bucket. <laughs> a bucket. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they would have had a pair. Um, but no, th- that's not what he turns into. Um, so Catalyst is sitting on the day of spinning when they arrived back at the farmhouse. She greeted him and said that they were paying her frequent visits. 
So this is her, essentially. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll catch me, fuckers. Um, so his, his companion seized the distaff and chopped it to pieces, just to take out their anger, because they're aware that she's one step ahead. And Kafka said, now, you, won't you have to say when you come home this evening that you didn't accomplish anything here at Holt since you chopped up my distaff? So, <laughs> look, at you, so, oh, oh. look at you big achieving guys. <laughs> Chop up my distaff. Mm. It's, it, it's, it's, it, it's very She's much the them. middle thing. She's got them. She's, She's got, got them, them. yeah. Absolutely. Sadly, though, sadly, though, the boss battle is yet to come. And this is where, sadly, social skills win out over a good sass mouth. And I, this is why I love Kat. I think she is just, she's got perfect comic timing. She'd work in a Scooby-Doo movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, so what was it when he was on the ashes? Do we... He was a pig. He's he was a pig. A pig? So they just, a pig. So they see oh, the, the obvious, pig line. the obvious thing then. Yeah, the obvious yeah, thing. Yeah, he's a pig line on the muck. <laughs> the ash heap though is... I think this is a translation. I think it's more likely to be a dung heap. Um, okay. You probably say, I think the translators say ash, but really it would just be general refuse and presumably mm-hmm. all kinds of shit literally would be thrown on there. And what likes shit? Pigs like shit. So mm-hmm. there's the pig lying on the heap and no mm-hmm. one will look at him because it's obvious that that's normal, right? So um, <laughs> they'd they rode away. All I, could, all I could think of is it's just a... Uh, <laughs> just, in, just in being naked and all pink, pink <laughs> human like just curled up on this ash pile pretending to be a pig maybe with like a little fake pig nose on <laughs> oh no oh no 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 that's that's the, see that's the kind of snuff movies I don't want to hear that you watch <laughs> this, is, this is this is Patreon content this is like be, we're getting we're getting into only, fantasy territory now only dance content <laughs> hey. Only Dan. If you want to see Fuck. Only Dan's fans, if you want to see, he he could wear you could wear a pig nose with your coconut bikini. Five hundred, <laughs> five hundred patrons. I'll lie on an <laughs> on an ash pile <laughs> with a little. Oh, a dung heap! Come on, it's... be careful what you say. It, you said it. the word, words are magic, Dan. If you say that's that, what that's what you time. do. That's, that's what, what got, got you last time. time. You said it now. You said it so. <laughs> That's my next Halloween costume. You have uh, created uh, a new reality right there. Halloween yeah. special next year. That's my costume. Dan's Halloween special. Pig in a muck heap. Um, <laughs> sounds like an artwork, <laughs> doesn't it? Pig in muck by Dan. Um, yeah. New kink. As the chat says, new kink, not unlocked. Um, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, Sophie, Sophie. Sophie, you are the resident artist. So if you want to draw this, I mean, that is completely you... up to you. <laughs> <laughs> completely it's, it's up to you. If you do, please, can I have a copy? <laughs> <laughs> I will put it in my office. Where, whenever I, maybe one day I'll get a job. Maybe one day after I've done this sodding PhD. And then that will be, if I get a job, an academic job, I'll put that up in my office somewhere. That's my promise to be you. Know, okay, there we go. If, if I, no, well, I do have one. Um, if I get one yeah, of those. Yeah, rub it in my face. <laughs> well, that's <this, this, laughs> nothing to <laughs> brag about. Um, you see that flex then? Oh, well, I'll put it in my yeah. office. <laughs> Oh, it's not in my no, no, I'll put it on the, the door of my office if I get a copy. Oh, oh yeah? On the front? Yes. Mm-hmm. They should Just be for my colleagues to, to walk by and, and see that. Yeah. They should be a picture of me. Hooray. Yeah. Oh. There should be a picture of me on your desk anyway, Matthias. <laughs> just, <laughs> just there next to your screen, just <laughs> smile. <laughs> That's going to be your Christmas present. I'm sending you a picture of me in a little frame to put on your desk to see. <laughs> no, <it's good. laughs> oh, boy. Cheers when you're sorts, sad. There is all sorts of stuff there tonight, I think. <laughs> okay, let's, oh. let's finish this story. I, I'm actually, I'm having too much fun, but I'm Because you have, people, you have people in the house who need to eat. That's just the fun. So oh, we'll I know. The story. I'm, and they're only hearing a third of this conversation as well, so fuck knows what they think is going on. Because they only oh, hear me. Oh, they can only hear you. Oh. So that's just a whole other level. We have to predict what we're saying. Oh, they've heard. 
all they all they've heard is me thinking there's a ghost up here and a pig man laying on an ash heap. So <laughs> fuck no. <laughs> Oh, I wonder. I would love. I would love to be a fly on the wall in their brains and see the and see how those bats are being filled. It, that would be so funny. That's, imagine me, you know, in my side of a conversation. Oh. Okay. Carry on. Okay. Carry on. So we're, we're nearly done. I promise. Um, and I haven't even got to the ghosts, but maybe that's another episode. But you can see oh, you're yeah. in a haunted. Oh yeah, the, the yeah, the, the ghosts. Yeah, that's that's another episode. That that'll oh, be long. Think, I, think, I think they deserve attention. The ghosts, mm-hmm. uh, and I I can give the spoiler about what the funny ghost is at the end. But that's that's yeah. all I need. No, we will, um, we will book you in. This has been a lot of fun, and I know. Hooray! If, yes. And if I and if I'm drinking, and you you get your. But yeah, and we need to get Mateus on here. This would just turn into chaos. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Really we, we might have to record this on a weekend. <laughs> Can we please do that? That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I can get day drunk. We'll do a later, we'll do a slightly later episode. So it's a little bit more socially acceptable, Mateus, for you to, to drink. We'll do like start like 10, 11 o'clock at night or something. 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then uh, can we hold a seance as well? Um, yes. Yes. As long as I'm not in this fucking attic. <laughs> I think you should be in the fucking attic. <laughs> I think so too. I, I will go into my crawl space. Yeah, quick yeah. pro-crow. Yeah. Crawl in your crawl space. Nuts in okay. a coconut bikini, though. <laughs> only only okay. Dan is doing this. I thought, hang on, Matthias, I thought you promised at some point that was going to be your thing as well. I thought you, you no, two was... and someone else was in it. He's getting out of it. It was Dan. Oh, you're right. It was, it was all Dan. I, I, I've never oh, promised that. You've never. Do you know the power of words? Um, you've clearly. You, you always know when someone studied witchcraft because they're afraid to say anything in case it comes true. I'm definitely. Mm-hmm. I think if I had a superstition, I think that would be mine. Actually, I think mm-hmm. the minute you utter something, it it does definitely take on a certain reality and possibility. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, so. I, this, I've been putting it out into the universe for weeks now that Mateus is going to do a drum and bass at Midgas 2023. I've been putting this out into the universe so fucking hard. Yeah. Just Make that real. The, the witchcraft makes it come real. Make that real. Make that mm-hmm. real. I, I, oh, all over that. Absolutely. So here's the end of the story. Uh, okay. I feel like a teacher. I feel like a teacher. I've got, look, I've got my storybook. And it's like that B- those BBC children's stories where you have to look like you're reading a story talk, and then you go, oh, hello, I'm so-and-so, and I'm reading a story. And it was, yeah. You have to be. You have to then be. you have these two um, shithead kids that aren't listening anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Carry on. I'm listening. I'm so... I'm sat forward in my chair. I'm listening, actually, in the taste. Oh, Sorry. Right. That's cool. <laughs> That's called brown nosing, and that's another thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so they chopped up Catler's distaff. She's been assessed, mouth. The men are returning home defeated, confused, generally not in a good mood. When they got halfway home, Gerida came to meet them, and she had one of her workmen with her. She asked how matters had gone with them. Thorodin told her, and she said they'd not searched properly for other. And I want you to turn back once more and I shall go with you. One cannot use halfway measures where Kathler is constant. So immediately, mm. she's helped. They turn back. Gerida had on a blue cloak. Uh, the importance of blue cloaks is two things. Rich material, very striking. A social thing if there ever was one. But it's also a revenge colour. And it's often, I don't know if people, people have read other sagas where there are killings, but often the colour blue is important. Um, so she's really putting on her, her gear here. Um, when they were seen approaching by the people at Holt, Kattler was told that now there were 14 in all, one of whom was wearing coloured clothing. And then Kattler said, that is Gerida the witch. So now mere tricks of magic alone won't do. Mm. So there's a lot on that sentence. She immediately knows who it is. This is mm. the higher power. This is the higher woman. She's afraid now. She knows immediately yeah. from the description who is, and she says, oh, well, she is a witch herself. So she's not only slandering her, but she's accepting her as the superior and saying, 
the magic is being used is essentially in the pulling the wool over the eye sense. It's, it's just a trick of the eye kind of magic. So she goes, well, I can't pull any of that on this woman. So okay. now I have to do something different. So she got up from the dais, lifted up the cushion on which she had been sitting. Underneath was a trap door and a hollow space inside the dais. Why she didn't just do this before, I don't know. I think there's a certain, well, obviously I do know, it's narrative. Um, there's, a, there's always a good reason to show that someone can do magic and for the tension to build. But practically, this is the best thing to do. Uh, she had odd get in the space and then she arranged everything as it had been before and sat down. She said she felt rather strange. Again, a higher power is coming to her circle. She's feeling it in her waters. She's not feeling good. This is mm -hmm. prime supernatural material. Um, and when Unkill and his followers entered the room this time, there were no greetings. So it's a bit like saying nobody served any tea on that move. That, that the gloves have come off. They're not pretending mm -hmm. to be for them. Get it's it almost... It's almost as though she she did the, the trick of the eye to embarrass the men and kind of yeah. take the piss a little bit because if she could have just okay. if she had this this little crawl space underneath her chair that she clearly thinks is gonna hide him yeah. from the witch, then why not just put him in there to start with and be done with it? Yeah. yeah. So you can, and of course you can interpret that from a modern eye view with good for her. But of course, from the medieval perspective, you can say, well, part of what makes her bad is she's undermining the people in charge. She's like the naughty kid in the corner. Uh, she's making fools of people who are pillars of the community and she shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. But obviously I love that she does. I think mm -hmm. it's terrific fun what she's doing. Yeah. Um, they all deserve to have the occasional middle finger, I think. Um, mm -hmm especially as all of them do equally bad things a lot of the time and they are off killing each other. So this is just another episode of that, essentially. Um, so Geirid cast her cloak from her and went up to Katla. She took a sealskin bag, which she brought along, and pulled it over her head. So, you know, she doesn't resist. She knows that she's in trouble. And, there's some, and obviously, from a non-Christian perspective or from a modern perspective, they probably write the story with more of a fight. But this is obviously now the non status quo person's had her fun, the community, the status quo are coming back to give her a big punch in the nose. And she has mm. to capitulate. By, so, the way, by, by the way, the, yeah. the seal skin bag has magical connotations too. Yes, yeah, it does. I was going to tell us about those. I was, you, you haven't heard, we've been going on about the ghosts for a while and you should have a chance to talk about this. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I mean, we see it in, in, in multiple uh, um, cases where if we want to prevent somebody from doing magic, we put them in a sealskin bag, right? So that, yeah. yeah, and pulling it over her head, I would say probably just that one of her powers is sight. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's to do with her being able to people. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what, is that what Loki gets put in when they catch him? In the waterfall, in the ghost mm. catcher. No, 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 they just no. catch him in a net. Yeah, no. yeah, but no. it would make sense if they if that was. It, it would make sense. I mean, if they were going to do a representation of that in a relatively period movie, the seal skin bag would be a very good. And of mm -hmm. course, it's a seal skins are themselves associated with folk magic, selkies, shape changing. All that kind of so ironically what's a magical symbol is being used to plow a magic another magic power fight magic with magic mm -hmm. which is it's interesting because it's they could just you know if this were an uber christian narrative it's not at the stage in history where it's uber christian but uh, you can tell this is sort of around a conversion ish period and not everybody's on board with it because if it was a full-on conversion narrative a saint would come and deal with her or there'd okay. be a crucifix like dracula yeah. but no it's not about and can we just like uh, address that for a second? Geri, this name, right? I mean, she, th her name is is a witch name, right? It, yeah, okay. Like, it means to it means to ride the stick, you know. So, oh yeah, all right, <laughs> all right. This this episode is filled with innuendos. <laughs> What, what what else would you expect? It's witches, man. It's witches, it's and point. of course, 
but the reason, of course, that's what's so interesting because people immediately think that having a name like that or being like she is, she'll be out there. It's not, but this is this story has nothing to do with magic, and that's it. It's to do with who's in power, um, mm-hmm. and that's why she. And she is, in a sense, the fact that she's a woman, and this is early on in the saga. So the natural progression of the saga is that ultimately Christian conversion does come along, and ultimately the male hegemony is what comes out on top. But this is sort of respect to ancestors, but it's also a sign of this is history. We don't mm-hmm. do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the old power. It's being replaced. And by dint of mentioning it, we are historicizing it. Mm-hmm. It's very punning, actually, Correct. in that sense. So there we are, magic's fighting magic. And she puts the bag over the head. Then Geria had told them to break open the dais because she immediately knows where he is. She's got the sight. Odd was found there and bound. After that, the two were taken to the pool and promontory and Odd was hanged there. So immediately they hanged the man first, interestingly. Mm. And as Odd was kicking the gallows, Arnkel said to him, it's ill luck befalls you through your mother and it's an evil mother you have, I think. Mm-hmm. So, a bit of a, a lame bloke after all her, her scene. It's like your, your mum's evil. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah. um, but it's essentially blaming her. But I mean, in a sense, it's disempowering her. She, they're making him the main event rather than her. And the idea mm-hmm. is, I think, that he has been corrupted by her, so more for him. And it's more of a shame, in a sense. The idea is that from the beginning, she has been a corrupt enemy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's you know we see that also i think in in multiple other cases where it's like mother and son right and the mother yeah. is corrupting yeah. the son yeah sins mm-hmm. of the mother yes mm-hmm. always sins of the mother sins of the, da- the son or the daughter and obviously son in that sense is a loss to the hegemony he could have been a good upstanding member of the the Gordy's cronies but he is he has mm-hmm. been spoiled and turned into a sneak there is a lot mm-hmm. that is arguing about other and you mm-hmm. could call him a bit of a Loki figure. So, yeah, he's been ruined. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so... You could call uh, him a little bit... You could call him a little bit odd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. God. That's it. Mm-hmm. We're done. <laughs> I mean, that's it. I'm doing <laughs> All right. Mm-hmm. I've been thinking about that one for a good 10 minutes. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> oh, feel bad. Oh, cool. Feel ease. Is that better now? Have you have you yes. put, did the ghost the ghost put that in your head, didn't it? No, 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 no that was all me. I, I all thought you, of that one. You thought of that one. Okay. Well, you feel, I'm glad you feel purged. I'm taking um, full credit. Right. Cool. 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 Um, so Catla gives a clap, one last clap back, and she says, "True, it may be that he does not have a good mother, but ill does not befall him because I willed it. This would be my wish." that ill befall you all from me, and I'm thinking that this will come true. So she's got one last punch from nearly beyond the grave, just before she dies. And that's the, and she says, it was I who was to blame for Gunnleider's injuries. So she admits that she rode him. She was the one who did it. Um, and they were the beginning of all the trouble. No ill can befall you, Arnkel, from your mother, since she's no longer living. And that's the guy who came to try and dig her out. But that spell would I work on you. That worse ill may befall you from your father than has come to order from me. And all the more so since you have more at stake than he does. And also I expect that before the end comes, people will say that you had an evil father. And as it happens, so she gets stoned to death after that. Very biblical. Mm -hmm. And what happens, interestingly in the story, is that all she has said does come to pass. Arnkel's father becomes a draiger and he ends up haunting people and killing people and he has to be burnt. And then even his ashes cause trouble from beyond the grave. Um, a, go- a troll calf is born from a cow that licks those ashes and goes on to kill. So it's just, it's one long stream of bad juju and it all comes from Kappa. So oh. she is present throughout the whole saga in what happens and in a bad way. So, you know, you could, again, this is definitely, it's a very badly concealed sort of Christian agenda here, I would say. But at the same time, from a modern perspective, because stories are for us to interpret as we wish, um, I think a lot of people could also see this as a vindictive narrative, a frustrated woman who could have had more power or somebody who was looked at the wrong way and never given a chance and therefore took out her power in the only way she could. 
Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's very Morgan Le Fay in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Cool point. I like that. Okay. Yeah, so Catlett is a badass witch, and I love her. And Gerida is also a badass witch, but I wish she had done more in the story. I okay. think it would have been even more interesting. Perfect. Let's 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 wrap this up. Dan's um, hungry. I am very Dan's hungry. hungry. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Now that was this was a lot of fun. Claire, when I knew you were coming on, I knew this would be so much fun and it lived up to everything Aww. that I hoped it would. Um you you're welcome. Much. You're welcome back anytime. We will explore the ghost story next, but I'm not in a creepy attic. <laughs> oh, are you sure? I, I think this should happen. Mm. No. <laughs> Maybe I'll try find something creepy though. Or we find... could make it happen. Try find something creepy, or we could just all present from the same creepy attic and keep each other company and drink in the be, same. I do that. that, that would I would be do fun. that. I do yeah. that. I would do that. If yeah. I wasn't alone, I would do it. <laughs> okay. We could try. Challenge, we, can, challenge have get, we have to get Mateus over here. Mm-hmm. Or, or if nothing else, I can come and join you because I'm on the same small island. And, you know, it's sort of, Matthias can join from wherever he wants to do. Conjure Matthias in. There is actually yeah. a creepy castle on a on a tall mountaintop out here in Colorado. Ooh, and, ooh, ooh. get some Wi-Fi up there. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sophie says, please bring extra sage to cleanse that space when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's just because of me. <laughs> it's just uh, to, you know I well I, to be fair I do need to go for a shower as well so yeah could be yeah. around that right on that note <laughs> okay. wash, no wash your stinky stuff I, and, uh, yeah, yeah I'm gonna go eat some food um, yes yeah thank you thank you very much let people know where they can follow you um yeah um, so if you're an Instagrammer, I am at Clarify, so C-L-A-R-E-I-F-Y, and Twitter, I am at Claire underscore Poet, if, if you, and Claire's always without the I, so it's, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, sometimes I tweet, more often I post just stupid pics on Instagram, so absolutely feel free. Very good, yeah, everyone go full of Claire, I'm, I'm sure people will find it's a lot of fun, I know I really enjoyed it, um, well I said I'd do an hour. And we've done like an hour 40. So that shows that I've been. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah I think we. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> we could, we, I'm sure we could do another hour and a half as well if, if I didn't have to get out of here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Obviously, if you can, you. please leave us a five star rating and a positive review wherever you get the podcast. Um, same thing as always YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, all at Naughty Mythology Podcast. Um, yeah. And we will we'll see you again soon, I have no doubt. Absolutely. Take care, guys. Right. Thank you for having me. See you in a minute, Matthias. Bye. 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 Bye.